Hello, thank you so much for, for being here, everyone. And it's really lovely to, to see you. And I'm so excited to be able to finally um, welcome Rocky to Singapore. You know, throughout the Familiar Others project, we didn't have the chance to meet in person because of COVID. So it was all uh, over Zoom or over email. So now he's finally here. Um, so let me introduce Rocky first. So Rocky Kahigan uh, comes from Bontoc Mountain Province in the Philippines and is currently based in Benguet, where he continues to work on uh, pieces that examine issues around indigeneity and specifically his Bontoc and Kankanae heritage. And he's part of the AXIS project, um, a collective that's active in programming and artistic activities in the Cordillera region. And you might remember their work from the 2013 Singapore Biennale with Kawai and Degaya when they were also here. Um, so Rocky explores material culture, indigeneity, and museology in his works, and we're going to look at some of those later. And uh, was very recently featured in the 10th uh, Asia-Pacific Giannale at Quagoma in Brisbane. So the reason why Rocky is here with us today is because of the Familiar Others exhibition, which was the, the most recent show in our project space, Dalam Southeast Asia. And the exhibition itself concerns the idea of the gaze on the other within the Southeast Asian region, and particularly a kind of sense of the gaze internal to Southeast Asia on peoples or communities who are somehow considered to be other or different, especially from the majority populations in the emerging nations of Southeast Asia. So in that exhibition, we looked at three artists, Eduardo Masferre, Yachue, and Emilia Sanasa, and all three of these artists had a particular preoccupation with the image of the other throughout their whole body of work. And they also worked in a similar period, the 1940s through the 1970s, a time of quite strong kind of nationalistic uh, nation formation, as well as the formation of the concept of Southeast Asia, the modern concept of Southeast Asia as a region. When it comes to art, I think, um, the, the idea of the gaze on the other or the appropriation of the image of the other has been a, a persistent theme, not just in Southeast Asia, but in the history of modernism in general. And it's something that I think uh, curators and, and historians of the, the art history of the modern have had to grapple with. And also something that we find quite consistently within the body of work that's in our collection at National Gallery Singapore. So part of the purpose of the Familiar Others exhibition was to offer a space to really try to think about this, you know, how to present these kind of works, what their implications and legacy might be today, and how to open up some discussion on, on what they really contain. So this is an image of the exhibition here, and I hope uh, you've gone to see the actual show in the project space. But you can see that one of the strategies we employed was to try to engage uh, a lot of text in the show to kind of open up new positions on the images. So the texts are, are written by people who had some kind of community tie to the figures or groups represented in the images. And they were nearly always, or in fact, in every case, uh, the people we commissioned to write the text were cultural producers in their own right. So familiar with the, the creative process of making a work of art. Um, and could kind of speak to the work on that level as well. So they included musicians, academics, writers, artists. Um, and through this uh, strategy, we were kind of able to open up more of a dialogue with the work and kind of unpack some of the implications of showing these works today. And so here's the collection of works um, from Eduardo Masferre. So these are all part of the collection of National Gallery Singapore photographs that Masferi made in the 1940s and 1950s. Here you can see the, the juxtaposition of image and text as it appears in the show. And in fact, the exhibition opens with uh, Rocky's text um, relating to this particular image by Masferi. So in a moment, Rocky's going to read from, from his complete text, because it's quite a powerful piece. But before he does so, I might introduce a little bit about Masferi as as a photographer and why he was chosen specifically for this exhibition. So Masferi has a very interesting history. Um, he, uh, his father had been in the Spanish colonial army and was you know, of Spanish extraction. His mother was from the Cancanae indigenous group in the Cordillera. So Masferi grew up in, he spent some of his early years in Spain, but predominantly grew up in the Cordillera. 
and he developed from quite an early age, you know, as a young teenager, an interest in photography, but was largely self-taught. So he, he sent away and, and had equipment kind of delivered from Manila, and he was inspired by some of the images he saw in photographic circulating publications, including National Geographic. And it's quite an interesting story because at that time, National Geographic carried some quite extensive and, and I think by our standards today, extremely racist coverage of the peoples of the Cordillera. But for Masferi, this was a way into kind of seeing um, uh, how to develop a photographic practice. Um, and so throughout the 1930s, 40s, 50s, he would photograph the peoples of the Cordillera region. So some of these people, uh, these communities, he was quite closely connected to through his Kankana A links to his mother. But some of them he was also unfamiliar with. And the way he described it in, in an interview in, later in his life was that when he came into these communities, he was a stranger, but not that strange. And I thought this was quite a resonant phrase, you know, the idea of a stranger, but not that strange. And it, it has some connection to the title of the exhibition too, the idea of a familiar other, someone who has a connection or is part of community, but also in a sense perhaps distant or has a, a kind of distinct gaze as well. So during his lifetime, Masfer, uh, Masferi established studios in Sangada, Sagada and Bontoc where he would take photographs for the communities, you know, um, working for the community as well. And then he would also do photographic expeditions further afield, and he had the practice of always returning copies of the prints to the community. So I think that's also an interesting kind of ethical dimension too. Um, generally, the way his work circulated outside the Cordillera was via kind of postcards, prints, also anthropological publications. And it really only came to be later in his career, in the 70s and 80s, that there was a sort of interest in his work that um, allowed him to, to begin to circulate more in the, the sphere of art. And that interest was initially from a kind of countercultural um, perspective, where he was kind of appropriated as a new, a new image of Filipino identity, and then later in the 1980s, more of a more kind of nationalist level recognition. So this is kind of potted history of, of Masberry and, and this context. Um, so when it came to the exhibition, uh, we, we invited Rocky to, to develop a response about the images, and he, he was free to select any of the, the images of the group, um, and really to kind of explore his own kind of associations with the image, his own perceptions as a piece of creative work. So I think to, to warm us up, Rocky's going to read through the piece, and I'll just put up the image that he was responding to. Hi, good morning. It begins with this comfort to look at this photo of a man from Maligong, Bantok Mountain Province, the Philippines, with the pipe, the soklong, and the stare that is meant to satisfy curiosities about who the savage is. It begins with fiction. To look at this photo that is meant to reveal a parched history of the subjugated. The photo assumes the tradition of power that dignifies collective representation with a single image, like that of the Afghan girl. And to look at it is to assume giving a voice to the voiceless. It begins with indifference. To look at this photo of an indigenous, one among so many others who have been taken or that have been taken by colonizers. Perhaps it's staged the frown, the smokeless pipe perched to the side of the mouth, the soklong holding part of the hair to reveal the forehead, ready for a caliper. It begins with frustration. To look at this photo is to be confused about who is material specimen and what is object or being objectified. It begins with questioning. To look at this photo of an indigenous taken by an indigenous as an indigenous within arbitrary definitions of indigeneity. It begins with self-assessment. To look at this photo in an institution that is perhaps on a mission to understand the colonial museology or itself, genderless and holding power. It begins with symbolism, the tattoo of a bird on the chest, which has been copied from a colonial coin, itself patterned after the American eagle and now mixed with real and man manufactured origin stories of traditional tattoos as material culture. 
It begins with a conundrum to participate in a decolonial project while anticipating that the institution cannot separate itself from continuing colonial habits and thereby enabling the tradition of examining indigenous peoples as photographed objects. It begins with irony. To go inside the Bontoc Museum, a museum for the indigenous built by colonial missions, then passed on to indigenous missionaries, Inside this museum, a young indigenous discovers objects that are no longer used beside photographs of indigenous history, people, and rituals. He takes note of the objects that identify him as indigenous. He does not have family photos or photos of his grandparents, save for those taken by and with missionaries. The colonial gaze is neglected as he passes one photo after another. It is hiding beneath the shadow of the of the photographs that are studied as mere objects arranged on the walls, carefully curated. The young indigenous will soon be put to task. He will explain what it means to be indigenous today. He will explain what it means to decolonize, a word that used to mean something more than a hashtag. It begins with a truth. To efficiently traverse the rice paddies, one must understand the idea of imbalance before balance. One has to be careful not to slip into the paddy, especially when it is muddy and the rice has just been planted. At the same time, one has to be careful not to fall off the retaining wall. It is the only way to move forward. It begins with another truth. To understand the idea of balance when one has mastered his way around narrow rice paddies that are only meant for one person to traverse, one also needs to know how to make way when another must pass the same precipice from the opposite direction. It is like a dance where there is no need to touch each other and yet no one falls and both are able to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's such a powerful text, I think, and, and so much to unpack there, not just about the image, but also about what we asked Rocky to do in this project and the kind of broader issues that it, that it brings up. But, so, so let's begin by, by talking a, a bit more about your text. So I wanted to ask you, know, why was it that you were drawn to this, this image in particular to respond to? I was drawn to this image because um, the photo was taken in Maligong, which is like where I where I grew up and where I was born and where my mom is from. And then, um, because it was familiar, basically. Um, and also the tattoo was familiar to me. So yeah, I found that to be like a, um, an interesting symbol that's been going around, you know, um, in the tattoo tradition of Bontok. And yet no one knows that it's actually American, so. Yeah, could you explain a bit more about that? So the, the eagle comes from American coinage. Yes, yeah. it is. It is very interesting because often the tattoos are kind of used as a symbol of like continuity or authenticity. Yes. And yet there's, there's so many like other forms kind of yes. incorporated that talk about modernity and colonial conditions as well. Yeah. Even in Kalinga, um, in the tattooing tradition, tradition there, they also have like a similar eagle and you know like they tell tourists who get tattoos that you know this is traditional but it's really not <laughs> and it's it's very interesting so let me also ask you you know you said just now that the image was familiar and and it's interesting because for a lot of the people who wrote texts for the familiar others exhibition they didn't necessarily they hadn't necessarily seen work by that artist before you know many many people were responding kind of cold to the images the, the dossier that we sent but in the case of Mass Ferry, both of the writers were already very familiar with the images so i wanted to ask a bit about that about the level of familiarity with this body of photography within the cordillera and in bontoc and sagada and 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 what what Mass Ferry's work kind of means in that space um, it's interesting because I am. I went to to elementary school beside the Bantok Museum, and Masfrey's photographs were always there. So it's like growing up with these images of a history that you know was photographed only by by colonizers, and then Masfrey. And his images are very ubiquitous in the in the sense that they're also used um, as souvenirs for tourists. 
So the family has given permission for these images to be, you know, put on pillowcases and sold as postcards and, and coffee mugs. So it's everywhere. And then and then you and you know a lot of young people from Bontok, where I'm from, um, you know, tr understand their history through these images. So there's that connection. So they circulate very widely outside the kind of space of the gallery. That's really not how you would typically encounter them, in yes. fact. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of your response text was also about the, the dynamics of the gaze and the kind of the situation of the gaze on this category of, you know, the indigenous. And I, I suppose I wanted to reflect a little bit about the, the long history of that in the Cordillera, because actually it's a region that was kind of subjected to a lot of quite intrusive anthropological image making. So uh, the famous example is the photo archive of Dean C. Worcester, who was the, the kind of American commissioner for the region during the colonial period, who took tens of thousands of photographs of the peoples of the Cordillera, which were very like, I think Marian Pastor Roches has a wonderful phrase about it, that methodical and cold-blooded in the extreme. You know, they're really a, quite a cold uh, archive of photographs. Um, and this is also an area of the Philippines that, that people were taken from to participate as live exhibits in the 1904 St. Louis Exposition. So there's a very long history of a very intrusive gaze on the indigenous communities of the Cordillera. So how has that impacted you know, the way you approached this text and also you know, in your broader body of work? This text is mostly a bunch of questions that I also like try to deal with and I guess um, the same is true with like my family and other people from from the Cordilleras who still, you know, um, try to identify as indigenous, um, and it's it's strange because these images be are, are also like where you look at your history, but it's the only one available, you know. So, parang it's either that or you do or, or oral history. So. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot to like deal with, and we, we don't know yet how to deal with it. I think. But I guess I mean the, the end of your text has quite an optimistic note. You know, this very beautiful metaphor of the people passing each other on the side of the rice field. That that there's a way of navigating people coming from two different directions. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, that's an encouraging yes, note, yes, right? A yes. kind of I sense mean, like, that a, no a negotiation is yes. possible. Yeah. It's always possible, but I guess it's it's just that it's hard to work from always being put in a position of loss. Mm. So maybe that's a good chance then to to move into uh, some of your own work and the way that your, your body of work as an artist has also grappled with these questions. So I understand that this uh, this show, Museumify, this was your first solo show. Can you explain to us some more about how this came about and, and what it's reflecting here? This is from, like I said, um, growing up beside the Bontok Museum. So I thought about, this was, I. I one of the artists, that, writers that you invited for to comment also on Mass Ray's work, Gawani Dumogo, who is Kankanae, she wrote a poem about the museum um, in Kankanae, um, fossilizing, you know, what is going on outside of the museum. So it's like two different worlds with very similar objects. And that's what I thought I wanted to explore with this show, with this exhibition about museumifying people who are within their own communities. What are, what are the objects that you, you gathered here for this piece? So these are objects, these are traditional um, weaving textile and objects I collected from friends and people and family and then put them together. And is the intention to form a kind of alternative museology? Yes. Yeah. More, more well, it, that's a loaded, loaded, you know, way of describing it. I'd, I'd, I'd be more practical and say, to kind of form a new object, or to un, to re, quant, re qualify what material culture is for, for us. So moving away from the kind of expectation of a kind of traditional material yes. or ethnographic material. 
Yes. So the the clothes and shoes and oh, those are mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this oh, that sorry. the this piece right here, um, the one that has like the one on your right. Um, it's after the sangadil, the death chair, because uh, that's how we bury the kadangyan, the noble class in the community. So I th I thought I would like to like play on that. So as an, as, a, as an object. So what is the object? It's it's used it, as a kind of upright yeah, burial upright. structure. Yes, oh. it's an upright. It's like two poles and then a chair and then that's where you like mourn the dead before and then bury them. Hmm. So I thought like you know to play on that idea. And what are the so you've reinterpreted it here with a different mixture of objects? What are the yes. objects here? <laughs> Those are my shoes again. <laughs> okay. Because um, I remember, like, I think the last one I that was buried this way because it no longer exists. Like, no one does the sangadil anymore. Was one of my grand aunts. Oh, okay. So yeah, so I remembered her and thought, okay, let's do that and talk about um, Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So, what was what was the response to this work? I mean, do you do you feel that it kind of moved moved the discussion in any way about this kind of issue of museumization? Well, yes, I think so. Like at least like within friends. I mean, they this was shown in Manila. It's far from Bontok. I've I've made work in Bontok, but not like this, or not this. Uh, this was never shown there. But you know, like it gets a conversation going amongst my writer friends and artist friends, at least. Mm. And I must say, I I was kind of when I when I read your text when it was submitted, I also felt that there was a, a sense of hesitation about the museumification of the potential museumification of this project too in familiar others, and and I guess the awkwardness of being tasked to speak for an image, you know, on behalf of an image, you know, as a as a representative, and both your text and. And Gawani Gayongan's text, who also responded to Masferi, really grappled with this, the kind of sense of being asked to, to speak on behalf of the image. Did you want to elaborate about your kind of feelings about that? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, when you asked me, I really had to like think it through because I, I didn't understand why this was being done, um, how special projects in museums um, are becoming really popular, but they're there, I, to me personally, I feel like um, there has to be a lot more done in, in, you know, in understanding permanent collections and how they relate to even contemporary artists um, and how, you know, you know, how that can be negotiated. And I thought this was going to be difficult writing about this. And I thought, well, of course, it's going to be awkward. Things like this are meant to be awkward before you know you go through a phase where you can talk about it like with a lot m more growth yeah. well i mean thank you for persisting with us on that <laughs> so uh let's move to to the next work because um you know one thing that's characterized your more recent work has been some attention to the uh, or greater attention to the backstrap loom and the traditional uh, weaving related cultures of the cordillera so perhaps you can tell us about the first project where you began to engage with this yeah so um i started doing this series of um works that revolved around the backstrap loom because i thought it was like a a thing that was similar among many indigenous cultures in, in Luzon and then also in Taiwan when I was there. Um, this project started with um, when I did the, a residency with this like group of young 11 um, activists who formed a collective um, and then set up their base in an old factory in Tainan, an old um, fabric factory. Um, and I thought they were like, it, it was like you know a moment where I was like, um, wow, 11 young, artists and activists, you know, uh, living in the collective and was, it didn't feel like at all like some, you know, passing hippie <laughs> stuff. So, so yeah. Um, so they asked me to visit friends of theirs in indigenous communities, uh, the Tso in Alishan um, and somewhere in Kaohsiung. And then we also visited the Penan Cultural Park and 
you know, like I th to look at the archaeological digs, and that's kind of like where the base of this is trying to understand. And then um, I collected um, fabric from that they used, um, like protest fabric that they used, and then cut them and like built this loom. Yeah, and then the whole idea is like to, um, for the whole the whole collective to help me set up this um, installation with objects that were already within the space, and then you know try to talk about what activism means for them. So these were materials that were already there in Tainan, not yes. not cordillera and materials no. that that you were using. Okay, all of the things here are, were found in the factory. Did you find that there was a lot of parallels about the kind of position of indigeneity in the discourse in this group or in this place compared with the Cordillera? Yeah, there there were like very strong parallels, but also like this collective was mostly like Han. Like only two of them are indigenous. And so, yeah, the, and even for them, it was kind of like a struggle to like talk about things like this because, you know, Taiwan was also colonized for a long time. Um, and also I met up with like indigenous people who, you know, in, who address the fact that they feel like they've lost 300 or 400 years of being who they are and then now are only trying to go back to these communities um, and rebuild whatever is left of, a tradition, um, which was which was very interesting because I thought to myself that never, it never occurred to me that that could happen. So, yeah, and the, uh, only recently has the Taiwanese government recognized um, some of these indigenous groups. So yeah, that was very interesting. The whole idea of that, I mean, but also like um, this set off like a. A, a, you know, this strange thing for me where you try and do some kind of research within a community for a very short time and then make work like mm. this. Which is, I mean, a very common model now for kind of yes. contemporary art yes. residencies. Maybe this can, can bring us to your, your next piece because that also had a very interesting um, collaborative element yes. in, a, in a new place, right, for you. So I so I also when I when I was in Nepal when I went to Nepal, um, a friend of mine asked me to like join this small collective also of um, artists from there, mostly street artists, and then they were like, "Why don't you do a show with us? We're doing a queer show," and I thought let, because there was so little time also. It was this was only for like a month. Um, I had to work. I mean, I I looked for like weavers within the region or within that area in Patan. And then I found the Sukul weavers. Um, they make like mats out of rice stalks. And rice is, you know, something that's also like I'm so, you know, I grew up with. Um, and then I thought I wanted to do like these strings, like, you know, when you lay out the first, the threads before you weave. Um, and then they also like, because the, in Hindu culture, in, or at least in the Wari culture, they also like wrap around strings. Um, wrap around colored strings on trees. So I thought, okay, how do we navigate this? And then how do I work with, you know, a suko weaver, you know, and, you know, just like in Taiwan, um, how do you know it's transactional? When do you know it's a great ephemeral collaboration? How do you remove your idea of what um, anthropology is that, 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 you know, get or ethnography is that, that means um, um, going into a community and spending time and, you know, having their right to work with, with a traditional So the, the craft. ethics of, yes. of this kind of collaboration. Yeah. And, and it, it was also funny because I had, to, when I asked uh, this Chirimai Maharajan, um, the Sukho weaver, to like, um, do you want to work with this, with me? And we need a translator, you know, and... And she was like, sure, but um, it was hard to go to a place where I was like, do you want to do a weaving of a huge dick, you know? <laughs> and but you How know, did you broach that discussion? Well, I started with like uh, the lingam, 
you know, <laughs> like <laughs> if we had to like talk about it that way. This was for a queer show, and she was like, "Do you really want to do this? Like, how would that, how would that affect your work?" As a, because she also like makes cultures. She's just not a, a suko weaver who makes mats for for selling. She also like she's also like an artist. Um, she makes sculptures and sells them as they are also. So, so it was fun. Mm. But I thought it was like, oh, this is special because it makes you try to uh, under, yeah, you know, like unpack a lot of like the awkwardness of transactional relationships mm. with, you know, with quote unquote contemporary art research. Mm. Why don't we have a look at the, the final product, the lingam form? <laughs> yeah, that. And, and how about the reception of, of this work and this show in, in the, the site where it was made? Um, it's interesting because, you know, um, because it was also in an old house. So this collective works not in galleries, but they look for old houses in the Patan area and then turn them into exhibition spaces for, you know, for months. Mm -hmm. So they borrow and rent houses and old forgotten spaces and then make work for you know artist communities mostly but also like locals it was had, had they engaged with the suku weavers before or was really you bringing them into this no it was me i went right, around right. you know because uh, it's interesting this collective is also like oh, um um they don't work with a lot of you know they they're mostly a young nepali nawari artists who will who who are you know like graffiti artists or rappers mm. and I thought okay well this isn't interesting <laughs> but they also want to make work within or in old houses mm. and I thought um hey well, what where are the craftspeople so right. so I, I thought right, yeah. right. so I asked a friend to bring me around and look for the school weavers and so following these projects you also kind of made a turn in your own practice to look at the the tradition of weaving within the Cordillera and uh, yes. as a kind of indigenous yes. craft of the Cordillera region. So how did that evolve? Well, I just used it as a kind of like the structure for an idea because I've, you know, I've already started that with um, the protest fabric um, and then the protest banners and, and, you know, the threads, the Indian threads. And I thought, why don't I do that for, with, with human hair, which I, you know, used to also work with a lot in the past. Um, but the idea also came from a friend of mine. She's Taiwanese, also an artist who worked with a lot of hair also. And then I kind of like, it kind of developed into this um, tongue in cheek idea of like, why don't I do a show about literal DNA? Like, yeah. you know, like collect hair from Bontok and then make a loom and see where that goes. So, so that's what we're seeing as, yes. the, as the, the threads that are set up on this loom is, is hair that you've yes. collected. And, and when you say that hair was, was used a lot in the past, you mean in a kind of, in the traditional practice of, mm -hmm. of the making of objects that would often incorporate human hair? Yes, um, um, they used to cut hair and then put it in like the soklong caps, like in the masquerade photo. Oh, okay. Yes, for, like just uh, as an adornment. Um, but also because my one of my grand aunts used to collect her um, young her, her hair when she was younger, um, and then they'd wear them when they're older, sort of like a, a wig, <laughs> add them to their hair, and then wrap it with snake bone. Yeah. So and then I thought it was just her, and then I, I they realized everyone was doing it. So I thought, okay, that's interesting. Let's work with hair. Right. <laughs> And the garments that go along with the loom, what are, what are they? Are they reflecting some kind of form that is common in, in the community? Or? Um, it, uh, because, uh, you know, but, um, even the mass fairy photos, you know, but women who didn't, have, you didn't wear upper garments. Oh. So I thought, like, because there was, like, and then suddenly, like, when people, when women were, when women started wearing, like, upper garments, um, with their traditional tapis, um, it, it suddenly became, this form suddenly became like traditional, mm. you know. So I thought I would use that as a reference point. 
And I think that brings up something quite interesting as well that, that also links back to Masferre, which is that he was, you know, he was educated within the mission, you know, the Catholic mission, and Sagada is a kind of mission town yes. in a sense. So there's also this, this layer in the Cordilleran culture as well, as the kind of tensions within mm. the, the missionary activity uh, within yes. kind of indigenous culture. Yes, even the Bantok Museum is run by, run by the missionary, so. So yeah, and it's interesting because because there's there's an enculturation project within the within the Catholic community, and they've also they were the first ones to involve a uh, school of living traditions within the educational program before it became a thing. Um, so and and my school was one of like you know those project areas where they started implementing this, and then they also like there's this whole like theology course where we look at um, introducing um, the rice festival within the mass the Catholic mass so yeah it's a it's a it's strange was it was it a technique for conversion to kind of be open to an existing set of cultural practices or kind of integrate them into a Catholic uh, I would think so system? but the lines between who is um, converting who <laughs> is difficult to frame because a lot of the indigenous people are also Catholics or Christians. I, I was wondering when I saw this piece because um, weaving, especially weaving on the, the backstrap loom or the hand loom does tend to be very gendered in Southeast Asia. So I wondered, you know, are you kind of taking a position on that by using the, the loom or? Does it does it have a kind of gendered implication for you? That's a yeah. That's also in, yes. You're right, but you know it's also hard to it, It's very difficult to talk about that also, even in the Cordilleras, because you know, but no no man would touch a loom, you know. So um, yeah. But <laughs> I know you what did. To say, <laughs> but I did, and I'm and I'm gay. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> But no, I mean, it was only, I mean, I know that that can be like an interpretation of the work and we can talk about, about it that way. But mostly it's really about, you know, this, I stick to that, like the tongue in cheek um, DNA, you know, literal DNA that, that is how um, material cultures, indigenous material cultures have always been shown in museums and galleries and, and try to question that. And I guess uh, as a final question about this, you know, it's it's interesting to to bring a work about indigeneity in in Southeast Asia to Australia, and I was wondering if you you felt any kind of resonance with the the discourse around indigeneity there, or if you had any responses to this work that kind of connected with that. Not really, but when when we started when I started thinking about what to do there. It was really just because because the other works were like very connected to where they were shown, but this one was not. And I thought, I'll try that because this will be in a, also like, you know, the National Gallery. Um, this will be in a, the will be at the Queensland Art Gallery, and you know, it's not that space. But they're also trying. They've been trying to you know like. Um, do a lot of what Canada is doing, like um, recontextualize where their position is in terms of dealing with indigenous peoples. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess we should acknowledge that this show was also curated during the COVID period, so it was yes. impossible to come and, yes, and immerse yes. yourself in the environment um, in which the work was ultimately yes. produced, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to open the floor to some questions, but maybe just before we do, I'm going to plug this book. So uh, the Access Project is a, a group of artists who were, well, artists and programmers who were working um, around the Cordillera region in the Cordillera, and they came as a group to participate in the 2013 Singapore Biennale. And perhaps you can tell us uh, what produced this book, which is also going to be available in Singapore, I believe. Yes, this will be available in Singapore soon. So we started this pro when when we were when the Access Art Project was asked to participate for the Singapore Biennale in 2013, we were doing caravans around um, 
the Cordillera region, mostly from Baguio to Bontoc and then Ifugao. Um, and then Kawayan de Guia, who was also part of the, the 23 curators working for the Binale at that time, um, decided that since we were doing 13 projects for, for this small room, um, we might as well come up with a book. <laughs> and so really um, that was the impetus. And then we moved on to like um, trying to finish a book within months and publish it, but we, it, was, it was just never going to happen. It was just too much, too many people, too many writers, uneven writing, which is okay. You know, it was like a whole, a whole, ex a whole project on its own. Deserves a whole show. <laughs> so, so eventually, like ten years later, we finished the book. Um, we went through like so many issues with people and writers, and you know, and things happening very differently. The but, pandemic, but now it's you know, it, it looks great. And so, and, but now we're like, okay, um, if anything, this is like a reflection of that time. And it was a beautiful time when so many artists came together. And access was also um, a defining moment for for artists in the Cordillera era because it was a it was like a a group uh, of a collective that we didn't want to be that we decided was going to not become a collective when it had a name. Um, <laughs> you know, but because it's like. It, it, all the art groups are like very cliquish and stuff. So, and we didn't want that. We just like wanted like, let's all breathe and try and find some quote unquote neutrality to all these things that are happening. So yeah, so we, you know, we did festivals and caravans and worked with communities and stuff with our own communities even. Um, so it was like a gathering of like 150 artists from everywhere, you know, coming together building access, being part of access. Yeah. And then we finally come up with a book and I think that's how we'll end that name. Yeah. And it looks like a very interesting archive of, of the project and, and of the region actually, of a kind of picture of the region at that time. Yes, I, I, well I think so too. <laughs> okay, well perhaps we can uh, invite the audience to, to ask any questions that you, you might have. Well, while they're thinking, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask because uh, in the, the set of projects that you've presented, they're all presented outside the Cordillera, you know, whether it's in Manila or with an overseas kind of residency. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, um, are there spaces where it's possible to show your work, you know, in, in Bontoc and Sagada? Or, you know, is, mm -hmm. it, is it possible to kind of have work that, that directly engages the community that the kind of ideas are, are coming from as well? Um, we brought access to Bontok when it, you know, during uh, the town festival. It's hard to like find space and just show in Bontok, but it's but it's it's something that's very that the community is very open to. Um, so mostly when, but most of the projects that I've done there are mostly like workshops and facilitating workshops, and we're trying to develop a show and a public exhibition now. Um, uh, working with like the local art groups and the university or, or the small college. Um, so yeah, and then there's also, I, our capital also like commissioned me to make work for the capital. And I think these are the chances that I get to, to make work and show to it show there. In that region. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, thanks, Vivi and Rocky. Uh, so I'm still thinking a lot about what you've said today, but just as a kind of initial question, because you've talked about commissions, Kogoma and the National Gallery one, and you've also shown works that you've kind of developed yourself or with kind of independent art groups. So when you are commissioned by an institution, how do you grapple with that? Because you, I mean, based on what we've seen today, I guess whether true or not, are being commissioned often as kind of representative of the space where you're coming from. So yeah, like is it different when you're working with a national institution versus the independent kind of um, projects that you've been doing? Yes, they're, they're of course very different. Uh, it's, a, it's a different process also. 
it's always more fun to like for me to like work with collectives and you know grassroots activists but it's very difficult to work with institutions i think that's true to most artists i mean it's nothing new also especially in this kind of positioning and but you know but if if the idea is to move forward a conversation like this then i think that's healthy and when there is awareness of where the power power dynamic is then i think there's a place there yeah does that answer your question <laughs> but Thank you, thank you, Rocky and Phoebe. Uh, you mentioned, Rocky, that the other was photographed by two agents, na? the colonial anthropologist and the modern photographer, Masfire. I was wondering if you can make a distinction between how they photographed the other. I mean, in terms of, let's say, the construction of the gaze. Would, would you, could you sense a this distinction between the colonial anthropologist and the uh, modern photographer. Yeah. Salamat, sir. I'm always nervous when Sir Patrick is here, <laughs> is around, even though we've kind of worked together in the past. But um, I think that holds true to many things, not just, you know, like when. Um, an artist, an indigenous artist, appropriates um, from his own culture, and when an outsider appropriates it from the same culture, you kind of, you know, where it's a kind of for me the same, now, you know, understanding of that awkwardness and that very difficult um, position. <laughs> But yes, I think mass. I think there's also a reason why mass Frey has been accepted by so many, uh, because he's from there, you know, and why Worcester is the evil other, you know, which he is. But it's it is a really interesting question, and I think we. Familiar Others as a show doesn't articulate a, a clear position about it because it's so ambiguous. And in fact, researching the show, there were a lot, there was a body of scholarship that really argued that Masferi was a continuation of the colonial gaze, uh, quite forcefully. Um, for me, I thought the argument, I mean, just from my own kind of perception of how the images are framed and how they seem to engage with the subject, that they, that maybe the, the distinction in you know, the ethics of mass various practice wasn't being very clearly made. Because actually quite frequently, it's sort of positioned as a, a very strong continuity. But on the other hand, if you, if you look at the circulation of the image in the community itself, it's embraced and certain aspects of the ethics of mass various practice, like working for clients who were, you know, based in Bontoc, you know, as a kind of commissioning for them or returning the prints to the community, as opposed to Worcester, who really like, I think one scholar commented the photos really look like they've been literally taken, you know, taken against someone's will, very a kind of unpleasant um, effect of situating the subject. So, uh, but obviously there's, there's a, a spectrum of positions on, on that issue, I think, that have emerged over time. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Rocky and uh, Phoebe. Um, Rocky, I, met, I noticed you used the term appropriation when you referred to Masferi's photos of his subjects. So, and in, in your experience of working with other indigenous communities, and how do you think um, people from outside of these communities can work with them in a productive way? And maybe here I'll also open up the question to include Patrick, who was working with uh, an indigenous artist from Taiwan for the last Biennale. Right? I don't know where to start. <laughs> um, I think you know um, the burden. Uh, the burden of the burden should should be on the outsider, but, um, to 
to understand where they should position themselves because always the, the, the power is always almost there. So, um, well, actually, there's a very interesting, sorry, there's an interesting text in, in this book um, that Padma wrote um, about anthropology and guide questions for indigenous people um, when they are attacked by, by anthropologists. So you should get this book. <laughs> no, note the verb, no? Attack. <laughs> no, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's also like, we, that, that awareness has to grow a lot more so that you can work with it, you know, and it's, the burden shouldn't, the reason why I find it difficult to answer that question is because it, should, it shouldn't be a responsibility for communities to yeah, instruct yeah, yes, how they are to yes, be worked with. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe Sir Patrick has some <laughs> answer. I don't. Yeah, it's difficult. And I think there's no textbook or manual of operations that can uh, really tell you what to do in the field. No? So it's uh, site specific <clears throat> condition, and you have to respond to it. Uh, Sometimes, well, partly instinctively and uh, also partly theoretically. So when I worked with uh, Sakulio, an indigenous artist in Taiwan for the Taiwan Pavilion, last year, I, yeah, I, he was a stranger to me and I, I was a stranger to, to him. So we, we began with the condition of unfamiliarity. And we, we work through that uh, over time in, in, in practice. Yeah. So maybe just a follow up to the, to the, the, to the presentation, of, uh, to the question for, for, for Rocky. Uh, the, your text begins with the, the word begin. Huh? And you, part of that beginning is crit criticality. So I was wondering if what comes next uh, after criticality, after critique, because I I worry that we're stuck in that sometimes, and uh, I know that there is contemporary artistic production, so this could be the third moment of uh, I mean beyond the critique. But I'd like to hear from you if there, there, there is that. Uh, desire to, to transcend uh, the uh, moment of critique. Yeah. Yes. Um, of course, there is a very strong desire because sometimes it gets very um, addictive, you know, being stuck in this position of always trying to... Um, I think that's why, like, but, but, you know, it's hard to understand where it could go. Even for like younger artists in Baguio that I work with, they also, or writers mostly, it becomes very difficult for them to create work beyond that also. But yeah, that's why, that's why even in here, when, when, um, when I was writing this piece, I was trying to go for a, a metaphor instead of what it feels, what it might feel like to move past and just move forward. Because I don't know what that forward is yet. I think we have another question. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, thank you, Phoebe and Rocky, for your wonderful talk. Um, so I would like to raise the issue of language with regards to um, the commission for Rocky. Because as a non-native speaker myself, um, I myself have very different mentalities when I uh, write, um, like for example, write critical texts or uh, writing in an uh, expressive manner. So um, I, th I think this question can be answered by both Phoebe and Rocky. So like, uh, firstly, was it like part of the parameter of the commission to to have the textual response in English and for Rocky, whether um, your process was reflexively in, um, originally in English or was it for you something that you have to struggle with and thing between languages and uh, I don't know maybe for the exhibition was there also any consideration with regards to 
trying to um, incorporating the uh, discursive device of translation um, within the exhibition itself. Well, maybe I can answer first about the parameters. So, in fact, the, everyone who wrote texts for the exhibition was open to submit them in any language. Um, obviously, the, that, that did pose the issue of translation. So, uh, Rocky's friend Gowani, who wrote a poem for the exhibition in Kankane, she also submitted the English translation herself because, you know, it's, it's difficult for us to, to work on the translation from here. But a number of respondents did submit in languages other than English. And um, sometimes we, we translated them inside the National Gallery. Um, sometimes for, for languages we didn't have access to, they were translated by an external expert, or in Gowani's case, she translated herself. Um, and you will see that for uh, Kankanae and Iban, we actually put the Kankanae and Iban text on the gallery wall. So Gowani's text appears with the English and the Kankanae both there on the wall text. And for all of the submissions that came in a language other than English, the original language and the full translation is included in the catalog. So I guess in the end, you know, of course, English com comes out more dominantly because we present the show in you know, the most familiar language to most of our audience, but we tried to incorporate as much as possible um, the original languages and the, the act of translation as an acknowledgement. And one of the nicest things about this show, I feel, was that for the opening event, we invited two of the writers to come, um, Gowani Gaongen and Kule Grassi, and actually read out their work in the indigenous language so it could be heard, because actually they were kind of poetic works within the indigenous language. So it was quite meaningful to, to hear the rhythm of the language as it was written. Um, did you want to add anything about your own response or working with language? Yes, um, I, I, use, I write in English. Um, we'd like to say in the Cordilleras that we were never colonized by the Spanish, but that we were by the Americans and that's how we you know, um, adapted the, la the language. Um, I feel like when we, we have a writing group in Baguio City called the Ubo Cordillera Writers, where uh, most of us write in the local languages. Um, but I've always found it difficult for myself to write <clears throat> in the local language because I've always felt like it was, it's like translating in my head. Um, I speak it, but it's hard to write in it, so because it's you know it's it's oral tradition. Um, that's why I mean, like you know, um, even Ubog with Gawani who also wrote that the the a contribution. Um, we always talk about this um, within our collective. How do you write? How do you stop a tradition when you start writing it? Um, so these are questions that are always there, but um, I think like it's. It, in, but you, you're just a different person. You, you try to become different persons. Um, because I grew up in Bontok, I speak Bontok. I'm a different person, I feel like, all the time, and it takes me days to adjust when I go home. Um, when I'm in the city, I speak, uh, we have to speak the lingua franca, Ilocano. It's also a very different kind of person. Um, and then you have, there's the national language, Tagalog. And then there's also like uh, my father's language, who is also just like, Gawani's language, Kan Kanae. Um, so like, speaking in different languages is always difficult. I think, I don't know how it must have been for mastery, but, <laughs> you know, but to write it this way was just, you know, like for me, like an easier way to like talk about it. So not just because it's English. But it's a great question. Thank you. Well, I think with that, unless there are any further questions, we might wrap up for today. And if I could ask you to help me thank our, our guest, Rocky.